Hi. So I'm going to talk about decentralization of energy and commodities via the blockchain. This is a conference on decentralization. I don't think it's possible to get greater equality and greater decentralization, no matter how many cities in the sea are created, if we don't decentralize energy. And I'll show you why. Um, should I point here, here? Point over there. OK, I'm, I'm pushing the right arrow. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Of course, it's, it's my laptop's not synced. OK, great, here we go. So transportation is a $5 trillion a year industry, and energy is an $8 trillion a year uh, industry. And over the last 35 years, we've stayed about the same percentage with respect to energy. So about 81% of energy used in the US was from fossil fuels when Ronald Reagan was elected in 1980, and it's about the same percentage now. And 97% of fuel for transportation is from petroleum. So and there are some issues with renewable energy. It's not that simple. First thing is the cost. So it will cost us about $100 trillion to transition from a, the world that sucks and is polluted and awful of 81% fueled by fossil fuels to one that's 100% clean energy. A lot of people have costed out. Most of the good work that's been done has been done within, I don't know, if you're a marathon runner and you're good, you could probably run there at, at Stanford. Um, and then also, there's, uh, you want to have decentralization so that anyone can be, I remember it used to be time sharing. Do any of you remember time sharing, time net and things? Some of you, yes. OK, so there was this, it was very funny back in the 60s, and I was alive in the 60s. Um, people were saying, you know, one day it may be that one company can own its own computer besides the, you know, being IBM or something. And the idea that it, like a human being would own a computer, that most human beings would own a computer, was just beyond most people's mind. And also the idea that you could be a telco, like when you're a node in a Skype network or something, I mean, you're kind of a telco. Or you're producing your own electricity. You're a utility. Or if you have some of these new uh, systems with blockchain, um, you're kind of a bank. Or you can make coins. You're a mint. And what I'm talking about is making each human being a refinery and being able to be the equivalent of an oil refinery only to produce something that's clean. Um, another issue is intermittency. Because how do you do solar at night? I mean, you can do it. Aben Goa does it with uh, molten salts. And it's in a few places. But how do you deal with wind on a cool day? So these are problems that need to be solved. And so, so I'm going to go over quickly some ideas. Like I asked on Facebook in preparation for this. Whenever I have to do a talk very quickly, I just go to Facebook because I have brilliant friends. And I, I'm not necessarily smart, but collectively with my 5,000 friends and followers and stuff, I'm a genius collectively with all of them involved. So this is what my friend said over the last hour. One idea, how do you decentralize energy? The old school approach leads to significant transmission loss. It's over 50%. The solution is to generate and store as close to point of consumption as possible. Tie that to a distributed consumption tracking model, and you're well on your way to a viable future. That's a pretty smart answer. And then also, use blockchain technology to allow units of energy to be identified by their source. This would allow people to buy energy from the source they chose, i.e., I only want to buy energy from wind and solar for my home or business. It's kind of like people who are followers of Dave Asprey who only want to buy grass-fed beef or something, or you only want to have cage-free chickens and things, but doing the same with your energy. Consumers would drive consumption rather than the utilities. This would require a net neutrality-like system for the existing power grids. That's from my buddy who's a roboticist uh, expert, Eric Schuss. Um, if you've ever seen Sophia you know, talking about wanting to destroy humans and stuff, he's uh, working with Sophia. And then, uh, let's see, and use blockchain to create a decentralized energy exchange market. You can join the blockchain with your own production system, set a price for your uh, your production, and then put it on sale. Small contracts will be the way to go, and the Ethereum network to run it all. OK, cool. And then here's the last one I'll f I crowdsource. Oh, that's clapping? OK. Uh, fund solar, wind, and other off-grid power tech by overbuilding capacity and using the excess to mint coins and serve blocks. Also use legacy coin farms to monetize excess power production like Germany experienced from solar a while back. We're seeing excess renewable energy production all the time these days. And another, now we're going to go talk about where basically people think we're going to go with renewable energy. So one thing people think about is, oh, it's going to be hydrogen and batteries. 
but both hydrogen and batteries have fatal flaws. Um, hydrogen has extremely low energy density, low round-trip energy efficiency when you think about how the energy you have to do to freeze it to almost 300 degrees below zero, extremely high delivery infrastructure costs. As an example, if you want to put a tank in a gas station that will hold hydrogen, it's almost $3 million. And also ultra-low temperature dangers. I mean, if you get you know, hydrogen, frozen hydrogen on your fingers, they'll be frostbitten and you won't be able to use them again. Batteries, EVs and storage suffer from extremely low um, mass, uh, energy density, long charge times, relatively short life, high cost and short range. Also, there's a materials bottom, bottleneck. To complete the transition to the, EV, the Elon Musk world where everybody has an EV, you will need about a thousand times the proven reserves of lithium and about a million times the cobalt. And I'm not sure where all that's going to come from. Okay, so uh, I am an advisor with Network Society Ventures, and they have in their very first inv uh, investment, by coincidence, presented just a minute ago, so I'll just say uh, this, but it's um, the Sun Exchange, which has solar-powered money, and we just heard about that a second ago, but I love the idea of the universal addressable identity of people. So I was the main uh, champion for Internet Protocol version 6 for about five years. I organized, I don't know, a dozen conferences all over the world, made a company worth about $280 million, and I love IPv6 because of the universal addressable identity, and I love the idea that you can basically invest and you can have your solar panel, you know, in Africa, and maybe like some of these aid programs where you adopt a child in Africa, and, you know, they send you snapshots and things of the child. I'd love to hear, I'd love to get some solar panels in Africa and then hear about this village that I'm powering up and what they're, what they're doing with all that. So that's the possibility. So what I'm going to promote, and I wanted to give it this big secret buildup, but I didn't have time to make the slides all sneaky, is a, a something that would have like a miracle thing. But basically what I'm talking about is NH3. NH3 has another name. Anyone know what it is? Ammonia. Who knew that NH3 is ammonia? Okay. Maybe about, about a quarter of the people here. I wish everyone knew this. So that's the sun. Sun does 23,000 terawatts per uh, terawatt years per year. Geothermal, hydro, biomass, ocean thermal, uh, uranium, coal, all of them. You can make ammonia from all of them. Now, what's so great about that? Well, actually, there's some amazing stuff that you can do with it. It can be a disinfectant and a cleaner. And I think of it as kind of a holy grail. It can be a fuel. Yeah, there are people who have been running vehicles on ammonia in Canada, in the US, in Japan, in Belgium and stuff for decades. You can use it as fertilizer. In fact, half the people in the world would be dead within a year if we didn't invent synthetic fertilizer back in 1909 or so. It's a great refrigerant. It's a renewable energy storage medium and it's a battery. In fact, the batteries for cell towers in Africa are as likely as not to be filled, basically, uh, containers of ammonia. And it's uncarbon. Massive creation of ammonia would lead to massive flows of O2, of oxygen, which would take a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere, and it's a process called resequestration. So you want to sequester carbon, and it's basically putting it back in when we've taken it out of the trees and things. Paul Hawken, who's one of my heroes, he's up in the Bay Area, um, uh, I think in Marin, has a whole book with 1,000 experts called Draw Down. Highly recommend it. It's about all the things to do and the best ways to do carbon. But the joke of it is to me, I couldn't believe it. I, they don't even have this in the book, and this is the best way to get rid of carbon. And what does it have? It has all the wish lists. It has affordability, safety, efficiency, environmental performance, sustainability, I'm sorry, my laptop isn't synced here. I will sync it up in just one second. Um, production flexibility, all those different ways of making it, end use flexibility, and you could do country building, which is, what I, wh which is why my talk is going to be potentially something to add to the, the wisdom that's been shared. So I'll just uh, say one thing about the affordability. It's basically similar to propane infrastructure. It's the second most transported chemical in the world. There are over 3,000 miles of NH3 pipeline in the US. Uh, guess who built most of them? Anyone want to know? It's the, it's the equivalent almost of a corporate tulip bulb craze, a one company disaster, the biggest contributor to George W. Bush's campaign. What? 
Enron, yes, give him a prize. You have a prize? If there's a prize, give it to this man here. Yes, and guess who bought it? The most evil people in America. The Koch brothers own this. It's kind of amazing that they're not green people because they could actually be the champions of green. I heard they funded Wonder Woman, so maybe they're, they're seeing some kind of a transition or something. There are 800 retail outlets in Iowa alone with no injuries, no fatalities and stuff. And this is what's kind of cool. It's basically hydrogen in a more compact way of shipping it. So you can have 1.3 times more hydrogen than liquid H2 by volume if you have that nitrogen in there. So, and we have ammonia storage. This is the part of the infrastructure. There's a, basically a parallel infrastructure. So kind of like where the, the world was with petroleum, like in the 1920s, that's where we are with the ammonia infrastructure. So we've seen this movie before. We know how to scale it all up. And this is, uh, this is how you set it up for the future. You just put this tank, and unlike a uh, tank of H2 underground there, it's, it's $2.8 million. It actually only costs about 68000 for a tank like that. And it's cleaner than hydrogen. No carbon. You use it to clean nitrous oxide out. There's zero measurable pollutants with internal combustion engines. It's not a greenhouse gas. It's an ozone depletion number of zero. It's not a known carcinogen. You actually, if you look at the safety stuff, you produce about 50 grams a day of it, and you can drink up to a pint of it without dying. So I wouldn't recommend like trying that out. Don't, don't do that You know, if you're fans of the TV show Jackass or things, but still, it's not that bad. Um, it's a huge natural occurrence in the Earth's nitrogen cycle, and it cleans itself up after spills. If there's an oil spill, you can blow up a town. If there's a pneumonia spill, the hazmat team gets there, and it's all gone, and they have nothing to do. So they can't get their hazardous duty pay. Um, OK, now, this is the cool thing. And I bet you've never heard this before. I just, you know, this is, I, I, I've never met anybody who knows about this. But basically, from just air, water, and sun, or wind, one relatively simple refinery producing this. And I believe that I could figure out how to do it down to a tabletop level. So you could do it like a caveman. You can have enhanced sustainable food production because it's fertilizer. You just have to uh, put in potash or phosphate. Uh, a versatile transportation fuel. You basically can put it in a diesel generator with some modifications in an engine, cars, planes, trucks, and check it out. It's the fastest fuel. What's the fastest thing that humans have ever made that humans have taken out there? Anyone know? Went almost Mach 7. Anyone know? Begins with an X. No one? X-15. So the X-15 is more than 50 years old when almost Mach 7. Did you say it? Yes? Oh, well, I'm sorry. I apologize. You have to speak up. You're a big man. You should have a booming voice to let people know that you know your shit. OK. And also, distributed electrification via combined heating and power units. Yes, you can make your heating. You can make your cooling. You can make your power. It's like those Ginsu knives. And it also does this. And you can set up long-term efficient renewable energy storage and all that. So it's an excellent base for self, uh, local self-sufficiency and greatly improved standard of living. Now, with all these cities, like all the seasteading and all this stuff, if you don't have make your own energy, your own food, if you don't do this, how self-sufficient? And what's amazing is it's like with this, you can do all of these ideas much easier. Without it, you can't really be self-sufficient and self-sustainable, and you can be embargoed. OK, so let's go to the next one. And this is what it can look like. You can basically have a biorefinery, and now that can be a self-sufficient. That can be its own state. That can be its own independent country, because you can have everything there with that biorefinery. So last slide. Uh, what I want are power partners. My goal in making this is to send out what I would call a, a, a high-frequency bird call for partners and collaborators. And I have colleagues who are setting up a blockchain clean energy fund that wants to monetize, incentivize, and decentralize the production of NH3 and other clean green fuels and power. And I'll take any questions. And happy to see you, Tony Greenberg, and my other friends who are here. Thank you very much.